Hi, my name is Quentin Raffaelli and I will be presenting the talk Quantifying the Stream of Consciousness. The main goal of this talk is to show a new method to study thought. I'm going to present two studies. The first is going to demonstrate the ecological validity of the task by showing that the thought that we sample with that method are similar to the one we experience in day-to-day -day life. And with the second study, we're going to demonstrate the usefulness of the task by showing that by using this method, we can get access to the content and the dynamics of thought, a facet of thought that has not yet been explored to better understand specific outcome. In this case, we're going to look at the case of brooding, which is a, case, which is a form of rumination. Thoughts are a quintessential, quintessential aspect of the human experience and they are tied to our well-being. There are many ways to categorize thoughts, but the most common way is to consider that a thought can be on task, which is considered good, or by contrast that it can be off task, which is considered bad and detrimental to well-being. An off task thought is when your stream of consciousness is filled with content that is unrelated to what you're currently doing. And the third category of thought that has only been studied one that I know of by Wilson and colleagues. And these are thoughts that occurs when participants did not add any particular task to do. They were left alone with their thoughts and it was reported that it was rather unpleasant. It's really very interesting as it suggests that the content in which, the context in which we find ourselves may have an impact on, on our well-being that is being engaged with activities that are most conducive to task oriented thought, maybe detrimental to us. So this is for the when, the context. Now there is a what, the content. Holding context constant, what we think about also has an impact on our well-being. This study by Andrew Zana and colleagues suggests that there are specific patterns of thought that are being associated with different mental health outcomes. For instance, they found by sampling the thought of multiple participants and asking them to rate their thoughts on different um, as dimension of content, they found relationship, uh, found pattern of thought that were reflective of individuals with high depressive symptom or high trait mindfulness. So there seems to be a clear relationship between thought and mental health and one that will be very fruitful for future research. However, there are some limitation. A lot of limitation about methodology. The first one being that our approach to studying thought is mainly task centric. In most studies, we're going to pro participant either when they're engaged with a task in a laboratory or in their daily life and ask them whether their thought were off task, was on task or off task. And we tend to neglect the type of thought that emerge when we are not engaged in a particular activity. And this is uh, particularly noticeable considering that if you want to better understand the relationship between thought and mental health, it may be more fruitful to consider both thought. For instance, if you were to try to understand the mind of a depressed individual, the thought that they have when they are not engaged in any particular activity, maybe more explicitly what it, of what it's like to be depressed than the thought that they have when they are engaged at work with a lot of chores. Another limitation is that we have limited access to the content, though we may have, we may ask participants specific targeted question about the content of their thoughts. We don't actually have access to the content itself. And the final limitation is that we have considered the when, the context, the what, the content, but we have not considered yet the how, the dynamics. And we believe that there is a lot of fruitful information to be gained in studying the dynamics. An analogy that I have is, it is similar to try to understand the movie by just taking snapshots, which is what we're currently doing right now. We feel it would be potentially more interesting to try to extract an entire clip 
of movie to make sense of it. And to circumvent some of these limitations, we resurrected an old methodology to study expertise, which consists in at which consists in asking participants to voice out loud their thoughts as they come to their mind. In our study, participants were left alone in a room for 10 minutes with a single instruction to just voice out loud whatever comes to their mind. And they were told that their thoughts could have many different, could be of many different types. It can be their inner voice, their internal monologue, or it could be uh, anything that happened in the external environment that they picked on, such as a noise or an object they are looking at, or it can be any type of external sensation that they notice, such, such as an itch or the sensation of thirst. All of these thoughts were recorded with a mic and then transcribed verbatim. And this gives us access to the entirety of their thoughts for those 10 minutes. Then multiple independent traders went through all of this transcript and marked the beginning and end of each thought so that we were able to isolate each and every of them. And they also rated each thought on a number of dimensions. Here we are going to be mainly concerned with valence. They rated the valence of each thought on a scale from minus five, extremely negative, to plus five, extremely positive with zero as being the neutral point. And they also provided each thought with a temporal orientation, past, present, future, or uh, atemporal, no particular temporal orientation. And then we used voice content and dynamic information to try to better understand our outcome variable, which is brooding. So with study one, we mainly wanted to make sure that the thought that we got with this method was reflective of the thought by participants experiencing their day-to-day -day life. So after the task, we asked participants two questions. One, the extent to which they censor themselves during the task. And two, the, whether the thought that they experienced during the task was similar to the one they usually have. Both of these questions were answered on a sliding scale from zero not at all to one extremely. So we had 28 participants who generated an average of 1,200 words, which considering how fast we speak is a great amount. And the great news is that participants reported that they censored themselves little, and that their thoughts were very similar to the one they experienced in their day-to-day -day life. And also there was no relationship between how much participants censor themselves how similar the thoughts they had during the task were to the one they usually have, and how much content they generated. With study two, we wanted to replicate the finding of the first study to cement the ecological validity of the task, as well as to show how we can use the content and the dynamics we get through that method to better understand the case of pudding. So first, we recruited 52 participants to perform the task. And once again, they generated a very similar amount of words, 1,200 words on average. And once again, they did not censor themselves much. And they said that their thoughts were very similar to the one they experienced in their day-to-day -day life. And once again, there was no relationship between those three variables, censorship, similarity to daily thoughts, and how much they talked. Now there's many ways we can look at content. Here I'm going to demonstrate two of them. The first is to use a language software and uh, a language software analysis that is called LUIC, which provides a proportion of the transcript that belong to a specific category. Here, our main hypothesis was that brooders will have more negative content, more past-oriented content, and more self-related content. So these are the three categories that we looked at. We looked at the extent, the proportion of the transcript that was negative, past-oriented, and self-related. For the self-related, we use the use of the personal pronoun I. And we did find 
that uh, hypothesis was verified by the data. As you can see from this free graph, the individual who had higher score in breeding tended to use I more often. They tended to use more negative content and also to use more past-oriented content. Now, as I mentioned during the method uh, part, we asked participants to reach each thought on its temporal orientation as well on it, as on its valence. And we used that information to see whether there was also a significant relationship with pudding. And this time we find again that valence had a significant relationship with brooding. Individuals with higher score on brooding tended to have more negative thoughts. However, we did not find a significant relationship with the proportion of the transcript that was past oriented. Though the p-value is close to significant, we suggest that it is a promising result still. Now for the dynamic section, we have three hypotheses. We wanted to first see, determine whether individuals with high brooding score were more likely to just cycle between negative thought, that is go, go from one negative thought to the next, to the next, to the next. Our second hypothesis was that brooders will have a higher proportion of their entire transcript that will be negative. And finally, we wanted to test whether participants that have high brooder brooding scores tended to have longer negative thoughts. So to do that, if you remember, we isolate each thought and give it a valence rating. Then we classified thought as being positive, neutral, or negative. Positive would be thought that are above one neutral between minus one and one, and negative below minus one. And then we calculated indices of dynamics. Here we're going to focus on two of them. The first one is the proportion of the entire transcript spent in a specific valence. So the proportion of the entire transcript that is positive, the proportion of the entire transcript that is negative. And the second indice that we index that we're going to look at is the average length of valent thoughts. So the average length of positive thoughts, the average length of negative thoughts per participant. So before we get into the actual uh, result, I need to mention that we wanted to see whether the two validity questions that we asked earlier, censorship and similarity to daily thoughts, had a relationship with brooding. The relationship was not significant, but it was close to significant. And this warranted to use those as covariates to make sure that they were not uh, to determine the unique variance that the, the variable that we're going to use have on brooding. Another variable that we were considering using as covariate was the extent to which participants talk, and this was warranted as, as you can see, the relationship is very significant. And so this variable will be used as a covariate for any uh, analysis in which we are considering the length of the transcript or the length of the thought, which would be the hypothesis number two and three. So for the first hypothesis, we wanted to see whether participants that have high score in brooding tended to be more likely to go from one negative thought to the next to the next. So to test that hypothesis, we calculated Markov chain transition probabilities. And what this is, is this is the likelihood of, of going from a thought of a given valence to a thought of an overvalence. So for instance, this is the likelihood of going of the next thought being positive if the current thought is being positive. Or this is the probability of the next thought being neutral if the current thought is being neutral. 
So this colon is giving you the probability of moving, transitioning to a positive thought, this one to a neutral thought, and this one is giving you the probability of transitioning to a negative thought. And so our hypothesis was that brooders will have a stronger tendency to transition from a negative to a negative. However, this was not the case. This relationship was not significant. What was significant, I, um, however, is the probability to transition to a positive thought, which was lower for individuals with high breeding scores. They were least likely to transition from a positive to a positive, that is to sustain a positive mood and they were less likely to transition from a negative to a positive thought. So it seems that for brooders, positivity is a, it's a repulsive state. Participants were more likely to randomly transition between or stay in a neutral or negative thought. For the second hypothesis, whether brooders tended to have a larger part of that transcript being negative, we did find that this was the case. Individuals with high breeding score were more likely to have a larger proportion of their entire transcript being negative, and they were also more likely to have less positive content, a lower proportion of their entire transcript to be negative. And this relationship held even when we took into account the covariates that I mentioned before, how much they censor themselves, how similar their thoughts were to their daily thoughts, and how much they talked during the task. The proportion of positive content and the proportion of negative content each explain unique variance in those models. And finally, for the last hypothesis, we wanted to know whether individuals with high breeding scores were more likely to have longer negative thoughts. So as you can see from the graph here, this was not the case if you use the average length of a negative thought as a unique predictors, predictor of breeding. But this was the case for positive thought. Positive thoughts were more likely to be shorter for individuals with high breeding score. So if you take into account the covariate that I mentioned, then both the average length of a positive thought and the average length of a negative thoughts are significant predictor of brooding. They both explain unique variance, as you can see on these two lines here. So to conclude on study two, we did replicate the finding of study one, which cements the validity of a task. And we showed that two methods to access content, to analyze content and look at its relationship with the outcome variable, but there are more ways one can think of to use the content. And finally, we tested different indices of dynamics to show whether they can predict a given outcome. And we show that individuals with high breeding score were more likely to have a larger part of their transcript being negative, and they were also more likely to have longer negative thought as well as shorter positive thought. So the main take home message from this talk is that we presented a new method to study thought, which allows to study the type of thought that occurs when we don't have any particular task to do and it grants access to the entirety of the content. And it also offers us the opportunity to calculate and use different indices of dynamics of thought. With study one, we showed that the task yielded uh, ecologically valid thought, very similar to the one we experience in our day-to-day -day life. And we studied two, we demonstrated the usefulness of a task by showing how we can use the content and the dynamics to make sense of coding. Finally, I would like to thank my supervisor, Jessica Andruzana, as well as all of the other people that contributed to that research, the GPC for the travel grant and the University of Arizona for funding. 
I would gladly receive any question. You can find my contact information here. And I thank you for your listening. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about some work that me and my advisor have been working on. Um, we're going to be talking about attention and mind wandering uh, during skilled behavior and making a case for what we call uh, pluralism about skilled behavior. Um, so the main question that we're going to be dealing with is listed right here. Um, is skilled behavior um, largely automatic or does it um, rely on higher level cognition as well. Um, on the one hand, uh, peak performance in, neat, in elite athletes is often described as automatic. Um, in a study um, by Anderson and colleagues here, they found that the most frequent response from participants um, when describing the execution of peak performance was the automatic execution. Uh, performance. Um, and so while the uh, automaticity of um, skilled performance is widely acknowledged, some worry that uh, too much automaticity and skill would challenge its ability to exhibit human excellence and that uh, higher level cognition is most likely often involved. Um, and so kind of two theoretical camps have kind of um, popped up. On the one hand, you have habitualists who focus on the automaticity of skilled behavior. And on the other hand, you have intellectualists, um, which focus on higher level cognition and skilled behavior. Um, we kind of take a different tack. Um, we argue that skilled behavior and, um, involves both automaticity and higher level cognition. Um, and so we call this view pluralism. Um, and we aren't the first to argue for a pluralist position, uh, but we take our unique contribution to be uh, sort of specifying the ways in which one might be a pluralist about skilled behavior. Um, so here we describe three. Um, they are level pluralism, synchronic pluralism, and diachronic pluralism. Um, and we use research on attention and mind wandering uh, throughout to uh, kind of illustrate how automaticity and higher level cognition are both involved in skilled behavior. Um, in short, we kind of feel like the first two uh, kinds of pluralism that we'll describe, level pluralism and synchronic pluralism, are um, kind of compatible with an intellectualism and habitualism as they stand, uh, whereas the third kind of pluralism we'll introduce, um, diachronic pluralism, uh, we think puts some pressure on both accounts. Um, before describing uh, each of the forms of pluralism, I wanted to say a little bit more about habitualism and intellectualism, uh, starting with habitualism. Um, so this is the idea that um, higher level cognition uh, interferes with automaticity and is therefore detrimental to uh, skilled behavior. Um, Hubert Dreyfus is probably the most famous defender of this account, um, and when talking about um, skilled actors and, and peak performance, he says, uh, that there's no place in the phenomenology of fully absorbed coping from mindfulness. There are only attractive and repulsive forces drawing appropriate activity out of a body. And I, I believe he got that last line from Sartre. Um, but his, his account is uh, um, inspired by phenomenologists such as um, Sartre and uh, Merleau-Ponty, but also dynamical systems theory and Gibsonian ecological psychology. Um, the basic idea here is that the mark of expertise uh, is the expert's ability to kind of immediately and automatically respond to affordances in the environment. Um, and affordances are just kind of opportunities for behavior. Um, and that this happens without the aid of higher level cognition. Um, and typically in dynamical systems accounts, they want to come up with explanations of things that don't appeal to their representations. And so, um, in this case, they have kind of a, their account of ex expertise doesn't involve any sort of representations, in this case, higher level cognition. Um, uh, aside from uh, the phenomenology, um, there's also um, empirical support from the sports psychology literature for this position. Uh, the most famous account of uh, choking under pressure, maybe not the most famous, but uh, one of the most prominent for sure, is the uh, explicit monitoring account of choking. Um, and so this is the idea that when you pay attention to the specifics of your own movements or think about what you're doing while you're doing it, this actually degrades performance. Um, so this suggests that when, um, you know, expert actors are engaging in higher level cognition that this is, this is actually um, detrimental to performance. So um, there's, there's stuff from phenomenology that seems to um, support this position and also there's the empirical support as well.
Um, intellectualism, um, on the other hand, um, does not think that higher level cognition is detrimental performance. Uh, rather, instead, they find it uh, to actually be uh, beneficial um, quite often. Um, Barbara Montero is probably one of the most um, avid defenders of this account, and um, she kind of ref she refers to uh, Dreyfus's idea that higher level cognition always interferes with skilled behavior as uh, the principle of automaticity. Um, and she argues against uh, Dreyfus's principle of automaticity um, several ways, but uh, one of the ways we think uh, we take to be the strongest is her argument from what is called uh, Kaizen, uh, which refers to the expert's desire to continuously uh, improve. Um, and so she actually uses Tiger Woods as an example. So despite already being the best golfer in the entire world, um, he actually did um, change his putting style at one point. Um, and he, he was temporarily degraded in his performance. But once he was able to master this new putting technique, he was actually even better than he was before, despite already being the best in the world. Um, and so for Montero, uh, she thinks that automaticity alone is not going to explain why experts are able to uh, kind of continuously push the boundaries of their expertise. And um, in order to do so, you have, they have to uh, think about what they're doing uh, in order to actually improve themselves. Um, so um, now that's, the background's over with that. Um, so after going over these two positions, kind of see what we, we think, uh, it's our view that um, habitualism tends to emphasize automaticity at the expense of higher level cognition, and intellectualism tends to um, emphasize higher level cognition at the uh, expense of automaticity. Um, instead, we take this um, pluralist approach uh, where both automaticity and higher level cognition are uh, features of skilled behavior. And so now we've uh, gotten to the three forms of pluralism that we'll uh, be introducing. Um, the first is uh, what we call level pluralism. Uh, and this is just the idea that different levels of skill will correspond with different uh, degrees of task-related uh, cognitive processing, uh, with it being the least skill you have, the more you'll uh, actually have to en engage with higher level uh, task-related cognitive processing. Um, synchronic pluralism is the idea that uh, different aspects of skilled behavior require different degrees of task-related cognitive processing. So it may be the case that some aspects of the task are executed automatically, whereas others are not. Um, Diachronic pluralism is the idea that uh, at different moments in the time course of skilled behavior, um, it's gonna, they're going to be, um, it's going to correspond with different degrees of task-related cognitive processing. Um, so at different moments in time, there may be automaticity and higher level cognition or both. Um, and so we think that um, the first two uh, pluralistic um, uh, brands of pluralism are actually um, compatible with habitualism and intellectualism. We think that this third type, diachronic pluralism, puts a little uh, more pressure on them. Okay, so we'll start with uh, level pluralism. Uh, again, this is the idea that uh, different levels of skill uh, correspond to different levels of task-related cognitive processing. Um, I've already mentioned that increases in skill level correspond to lower levels of required attention. Uh, in fact, many, dual, um, many studies use dual task experiments to demonstrate that behaviors are fully automatized. Uh, so participants will be performing an action uh, while keeping their attention on a secondary task, oftentimes like a counting task. Um, so this, this case is, is generally pretty clear in the case of attention. Uh, the more skilled you are, the less retention that is required. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about level pluralism as it relates to mind wandering. Uh, so um, just before we go any further, uh, mind wandering has been defined as a uh, class of spontaneously generated thoughts um, that um, are characterized by their lack of um, attentional constraint. Um, and, and just kind of thinking about our own lives, um, whenever you're doing um, kind of ordinary, highly skilled behavior, such as doing dishes, washing um, you know, your clothes, doing laundry, 
uh, or uh, driving a car, um, your mind's frequently wander in these situations. And it's uh, thought to be because um, practice actually decreases the dependence of working memory and uh, decreases your um, dependence on working memory and executive resources. Um, so at this point, the habitualist could say, well, um, you know, kind of well, hold up. Um, doesn't my monitoring doesn't really seem to threaten our account because the contents of my monitoring episodes are generally like unrelated to the task. Um, but there's actually evidence that, um, that this is not actually true, that my monitoring can actually be task relevant. And it is uh, more often um, than you would think. Uh, one study actually found asked people to report the contents of their mind wandering episodes and found that nearly half of all mind wandering episodes were about the future and half of those were about their um, the subject's immediate goals and uh, concerns um, so this study um, kind of suggests that one way that mind wandering could um, contribute to expert action is um, by kind of bolstering uh, experts situation specific responding right by having these um, episodes of spontaneous cognition kind of uh, priming them uh, to uh, to act um, another way that uh, skilled behavior could be, be um, benefited by mind wandering is uh, in the case of creativity there's actually also research that uh, mind wandering is uh, important for the incubation stage of creativity um, one like we could use the example of knitting a hat for a friend. So maybe you are knitting a, uh, a gray hat for your friend, but then you have a mind wandering episode about Lisa Frank and how much you loved your notebooks when you were in elementary school. And so you decide that you are going to change the hat to be a rainbow hat instead of a gray hat. So this would be an example of a mind wandering episode and kind of feeding into the ongoing action and actually having an influence on the, the final uh, outcome. Uh, so to kind of sum up uh, level pluralism, uh, we think it's both compatible with habitualism and intellectualism. Uh, so we think that it's compatible with habitualism because it um, habitualism helps explain the reduction in required um, task uh, relevant higher level cognition during skilled behavior. Uh, but we also think it's compatible with intellectualism because uh, using the tools of intellectualism can help us explain uh, the emergence of uh, new forms of higher level cognition during skilled behavior, in, in particular. Uh, task-related spontaneous cognition. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, now I'm going to talk about um, synchronic pluralism uh, in the context of attention. Um, so synchronic pluralism is the idea that different aspects of skilled behavior um, require different degrees of task-related cognitive processing. Um, so uh, David Papineau has actually made a distinction between uh, attention to uh, basic action and attention to the components of that action. Um, so a basic action is just uh, the action that the agent is intending to perform, whereas um, the components refer to the lower level behaviors that uh, make up the um, basic action. Um, so I think he uses the example of tying a shoe. So the basic action would be tying one's shoe, the components would be grabbing the shoelace, making uh, a loop, um, and so on. Um, and there's actually um, been some work on this um, with typists. So uh, typists are said as they're learning uh, to chunk uh, behaviors together as, as they're learning. So um, according to uh, Papineau, he argues that uh, attention to basic action is uh, essential, but attention to the components of the basic action is actually um, harmful. So in a way, the intellectualists and habitualists are both kind of right and wrong about this. Um, and here we uh, have included just like a little um, visualization of this. On the y-axis, we have like skill level. And as you can see, um, as you get more and more skilled, um, more and more of uh, your actions become automatized and the amount of higher level cognition is, um, is decreased as you increase your skill level, uh, although it doesn't completely um, vanish on our visualization here. Um, and so we think that um, this is actually, uh, this form of pluralism will be welcomed by both habitualists and intellectualists alike, uh, but we think the next form of pluralism, diachronic pluralism, uh, puts a little pressure on uh, both of the existing accounts. 
So uh, diachronic pluralism is the idea that uh, different moments in a time course's skilled behavior will correspond with different degrees of task-related cognitive processing. Uh, describing the results of a mind-wandering study, uh, Smallwood and his colleagues uh, say that their data suggests that uh, when trying to gauge intention in a sustained manner, uh, the mind will naturally ebb and flow in the depth of cognitive analysis that applies to uh, the environment. Um, so um, just in the cyclical way that attention and mind wandering works, um, in skilled behavior, we should expect mind wandering uh, or, you know, those periods of time where um, our attention kind of drifts away from the immediate perceptual environment. Um, so, yeah, we think that attention and mind wandering are both likely to wax and wane uh, during skilled behavior, um, just as it does so um, when not in skilled behavior, um, just due to the activity of ongoing slow wave oscillations. Uh, so both the default mode network, which is associated with mind wandering and inwardly directed attention, um, and uh, task-related attention uh, are both governed by uh, slow wave oscillations. Um, and so um, kind of going back to our knitting example, um, we can, um, you know, as, at, as one kind of knits, at one time you might be very intentionally engaged, um, but then other times maybe not, and that this is will kind of like ebb and flow throughout the skilled um, behavior, just as a result of these slow wave oscillations that are governing uh, both. Um, and here we have like a little visualization of this um, with synchronic and level pluralism kind of baked in. Um, the gray line running throughout uh, is supposed to represent the involvement of attention. Uh, and as you can see, it kind of cycles in and out, um, kind of representing the moments where you're highly intentionally engaged, and then it kind of uh, flows out, um, leaving these um, little valleys in which mind-wandering episodes um, can occur, some of which would be potentially task-related. Um, so in short, um, skilled behavior uh, will benefit um, from higher level cognition at some times, uh, but not at other times. Um, so we, we also have a, um, a special case of diachronic pluralism. Um, this is what we call um, uh, strategic automaticity. And we think that this in particular kind of puts pressure on um, both habitualism and intellectualism. Um, and so strategic automaticity is just, um, this is um, when essentially you um, use higher level cognition to initiate a sequence of behaviors, but not to perform them. Um, so strategic automaticity is normally mentioned in terms of what are called uh, implementation intentions or uh, if-then planned behavior, um, in which one intends to perform a behavior if a certain condition arises. <clears throat> so going back to our knitting example, um, so say you're knitting the rainbow hat and one might in, uh, intend to uh, what's called purling a, a row once you've finished knitting it. Um, so by setting the intention to purl um, once you have finished the row, this is an example of strategic automaticity or an if-then planned behavior. Um, so by setting the intention in advance to purl a stitch, once one reaches the end of the row, the behaviors required to do the purl stitch can be initiated automatically once the knitter perceives they have um, reached the end of that row. Um, so um, how does strategic automaticity challenge intellectualism and habitualism? Um, well, it challenges intellectualism by challenging the idea that high level cognition is always present in skilled behavior to some degree. Uh, but it also puts pressure on the habitualist uh, idea that peak performance is always automatic, absent of higher level cognition. Uh, instead, um, strategic automaticity is a special case in which peak performance is at some point initiated by higher level cognition, but is ultimately executed automatically, making it a form of diachronic pluralism. Okay, uh, and just to uh, wrap up real quick, um, so we've argued for uh, pluralism about skilled behavior, uh, the idea that automaticity and higher level cognition are woven together to facilitate skilled behavior. Uh, we describe three different kinds of uh, pluralism, uh, and we uh, think that both level pluralism and synchronic pluralism will be kind of welcomed and is compatible by, uh, with habitualism and intellectualism. Uh, but we think our third kind of pluralism, diachronic pluralism, 
um, challenges both habitualism uh, and intellectualism, uh, especially in, in the case of strategic, strategic automaticity. Uh, thank you all very much. Welcome to the Science and Consciousness Conference, the concurrent session on awareness and consciousness. This presentation will be on psychophysiological effects of increasing awareness of non-dual consciousness and the natural state in young adults who are affected with depression and anxiety. My name is Milena Brodisevic. I hold a PhD in integral health from the California Institute for Human Science, and I'm also the founder of Non-Dual Perspectives, and you can read more about my work at nondualperspectives.com. So the reason why I wanted to do a research study on uh, mental health and non-dual consciousness, and specifically young adults, is because common mental disorders currently account for about 30% of the global disease burden based on the World Health Organization data. And young adulthood, the time between 18 and 29 years of age, is actually a very important transitional period in a person's life with significant implications for the future, career, family, health, and well-being of the person. And prevalence of anxiety and depression is actually the highest in young adulthood. One out of five adults, uh, young adults are affected by common mental disorders compared to one out of 10 um, other adults. And also, uh, common mental disorders are on the rise in this population. Um, they're actually the most common reason why young adults seek um, counseling. At the same time, less than 20% of young adults currently receive appropriate treatment, and they often receive it very late, which in increases um, you know, the visits to emergency room, as well as hospitalizations for mental health issues. Now, symptoms of depression include hopelessness, sadness, loss of, in loss of interest in daily activities, as well as low sense of meaning and agency, which can have profound effects on a person's life. And symptoms of anxiety include extensive worry, inability to relax, and just feeling overwhelmed and as if something terrible might happen. Now, it's important to note that all mental disorders are actually fragmentations of the psyche, and they involve a level of dissociation from reality. My research was also inspired by alternative healing modalities. Um, there are currently about 150 scientists around the world that are researching the effects of um, psilocybin as well as ay ayahuasca and other modalities uh, on the treatment of uh, depression and anxiety as well as PTSD um, and addiction. And what this research shows us is that we, by tapping into the mind's natural healing abilities, we can actually awaken non-dual consciousness and have this sense of integration of experience, which can profoundly influence a person's perception of life, as well as their sense of meaning. It can lead to a disillusion of the ego and a sense of se uh, separateness or this subject-object duality, and reduction in the activity of the amygdala and the default mode network which is really responsible for worry and rumination. And it can lead to a more direct experience of life as it really is beyond the conceptual mind. So my research is really looking at how can we um, tap into these healing um, properties of non-dual consciousness without the use of um, alternative healing modalities such as um, psychedelics. So the nature of the mind, it's important to note, is embodied, which means that there is a mind-body connection. It's also emerging in nature, which means that the mind can be developed. And it's relational in nature, which means that uh, the health of our mind really depends on the health of our relationship with ourselves, with others, as well as with nature. Now, duality is this idea of good versus bad, or mind versus body, or self versus other. It's this um, tendency for identification and separation. And it's important to note that language, words, thoughts, and concepts are actually dualistic in nature. Um, and while they can be very helpful for communication, if we fully identify with our thoughts and concepts, then we experience reality as fragmented. Now, on the other hand, non-duality is the fact that in nature, there are no absolute or fixed states. Um, according to the physicist David Bohm, everything in nature is interconnected, and it's going through this continuous process of development and change, what he called the process of becoming. And this non-dualistic view really leads to integration. 
Now, in literature, non-duality was first seen in the Advaita Vedanta, in the Upanishads, about a thousand years uh, BC. And Advaita literally means not to. So this teaching is a reminder that in nature, all things are deeply integrated and that they are one, that God or Brahman, as well as true self or Atman, are ultimately the same. And in Buddhism, there's this idea of emptiness or the fact that nothing is, exists in and of itself and that everything exists only in relation to everything else. Now, non-duality cannot really be um, understood with a conceptual mind or described in words. It is more of a state of being. It's a direct experience of things as they are. Now, the natural state is um, this state of this direct experience of reality beyond the conceptual mind. It's the experience of effortless effort and of just being alive. Now, due to its fragmenting nature, the rational mind is actually incapable of comprehending this unified nature of reality. So to gain true understanding of that, one must really go beyond the rational mind and um, really unify with things to fully experience them. I just wanted to illustrate the dualistic and a non-dual view, and um, you can really have a dualistic and a non-dual perspective on anything. But in the case of this coffee mug, according to a dualistic perspective, you know, I see a coffee mug, that's all it ever was, that's all it ever will be. And it doesn't really matter what I do with it because the coffee mug and I are separate. Now, according to a non-dual perspective, I'm looking at the same thing, but I have this deep understanding that, you know, this is a coffee mug now, but it comes from clay, which comes from minerals, which comes from the earth. And then depending on what I do with it, I can really affect its reality. So it can become garbage or it can be upcycled into another form of clay, or it can be recycled back into the earth. Now for the natural state, um, I will use the metaphor of the sun. Um, so the natural state is kind of like the light of the sun, right? It just shines, um, um, you know, and it's not really limited. Now the dualistic conditioning or the thinking mind is kind of like the clouds in the sky. So um, the point is not necessarily to change our natural state in any way, but to really remove this dualistic conditioning so that it can really shine its all, in all its manifestations. This is a really good quote on the non-dual view, just to illustrate it. It's by Andy Fisher from his essay, uh, What is Eco-Psychology? And the quote goes, my lungs have no meaning without air, which has no meaning without plants, which have no meaning without the sun, and so on ad infinitum. So what this quote really shows is it's not just that my lungs are connected to the air, which is connected to the plants and so on. It's actually that all of these things are deeply implied in one another. You know, there would be no lungs without the air or without the plants or without the sun. So this really illustrates that integrated nature of reality. Now, the purpose of my study was to explore how increasing awareness of non-dual consciousness and the natural state can impact young people who are experiencing depression and anxiety. My methodology consisted of four sessions, one hour long each, over four weeks, and each session had an educational, experiential, and a behavioral component. And then the study was mixed method and quantitative data included um, levels of depression, anxiety before and after the study. And for this I used that depression inventory and the GAD7 questionnaire. I also collected age, gender, number of years experiencing symptoms, uh, reasons for joining the study, and then any treatment that was received in the past. And then the qualitative data included written descriptions of phenomenological experiences during each session, and then written reflections from weekly behavioral practices on the participants' experiences. And this is a picture of me during one of the sessions during the educational component. Um, the study population included 17 young adults uh, between the age of 18 and 29 living in Toronto, Canada. About 59% uh, were students, 76% um, female, 18% male, and 6% non-binary. And the average age was 23.5 years. And people were experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression on average for 5.4 years. Previous treatment included medication, 
cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, yoga, and meditation practices. And then the topic of session one was non-duality. And in the educational component, I talked about duality versus non-duality. Um, I explain non-duality as this um, idea that there are no fixed states or fragmentation in nature, um, and that non-duality is a direct experience beyond the conceptual mind. And then in the experiential component, I introduced the guided meditation to really experience non-duality by focusing on the space between thoughts and the sense of effortless effort and feeling alive. And then for the behavioral component, um, I instructed the participants to practice non-dual awareness throughout the week and to become more aware of dualistic conditioning in their daily life and to try to experience the space between thoughts and the sense of just effortless effort and feeling alive. And then session two, um, the topic was the natural state, uh, where I explained that um, the, the natural state is this ex direct experience of reality as it is. I also explained that the natural state is a relaxed state of contemplation, and that it is always available to us if we know how to access it. I also talked about um, heart rate variability, which is this metric that actually is the only physiological way to uh, measure depression and anxiety. And it really shows how quickly an organism can go from an active state to a relaxed state. And this really shows the importance of learning how to activate the relaxation response and access this natural state on a daily basis for the health of our whole system. In the experiential component, I, um, I walked the participants through the meditation of experience, experiencing the natural state as the light of the sun and passing thoughts as the cloud in, clouds in the sky and experiencing this sense of effortless effort and feeling alive. And then in the behavioral component, I instructed participants to practice the natural state throughout the week by using the sun metaphor, metaphor and by, again, tuning into the space between thoughts. So just building on the meditation and behavioral exercises from the first session. And then the topic of the third session was the emerging and relational nature of the mind. And in the educational component, I explained that the mind has the ability to develop and that the health of the mind really depends on the health of our relationship with ourselves, with others, and with nature. And I also talked about ego developmental stages or levels of consciousness that are available to us when it comes to how we relate to the world. Um, and I walked the participants through um, egocentric, ethnocentric, and then world-centric and unitive ego developmental stages. So from kind of dualistic to more non-dual uh, states of consciousness. And then in the experiential component, um, I walk them through a guided meditation to experience the non-dual emerging and relational nature of the mind. And also uh, contemplate the quote, my lungs have no meaning without air, which has no meaning without plants, which has no meaning without the sun, and so on at infinitum. And in the, in the behavioral component, I instructed participants to reflect on this emerging and relational nature of the mind throughout that week, um, and then to reflect on this quote that we um, had in the session. And then in session four, um, this in, involved the kind of thorough review of the first three sessions. And then we talked about future challenges in the context of non-dual consciousness and um, awareness. And we talked about the future of work and the importance of skills such as critical thinking. So the ability to see beyond black and white um, ways of thinking, and then the importance of creativity as well as collaboration. We also talked about the future of economic and environmental sustainability in the non-dual context, as well as technology and healthcare in the context of this integral paradigm. And then the experiential component of the fourth session was also a meditation to experience this non-dual emerging and relational nature of the mind. And for this, I also used some affirmations on the sense of unity, of the sense of acceptance of the person as they are, um, tapping into their natural state and just appreciating um, oneself as they are. And then here are the findings. So um, as I said, I, I use the Beck Depression Inventory um, to look at the depression scores. And these were the average scores. So at the beginning of the study, the average score was 19.4, which was at the level of clinical depression. And then after the study, it was at the level of 10, which is normal. 
and then 30 days after, um, it was at the level of 8.8, .8, and then six months after, it was at the level of 8.3. So stay, it stayed in the normal range, and the average depression scores actually decreased over time. And then for anxiety scores, based on the GAD7 questionnaire, um, the average anxiety score before the session was 12.7, which indicates a moderate level of anxiety. And then after the um, workshop, it was at the mild level, 6.9. And then a 30-day follow-up, it was 5.4, 6, still at the mild level. And then six months after, it was at the level of 5, which is actually normal. So this shows that this increased um, non-dual consciousness and awareness of the natural state actually potentially created an upward spiral uh, where the symptoms of anxiety and depression actually continued to decline and the person kept feeling more well-being and better mental uh, and emotional health. I also recorded the change in symptoms um, in terms of the reasons for joining the study. Um, so feelings of being overwhelmed were reduced by 65% at the end of the study. Feeling lack of confidence was reduced by 47%. Feeling confused was reduced by 41%. Feelings of disconnection were reduced by 42%. Uh, worry about the future was reduced by 35%, as well as uh, feeling the lack of creative expression was reduced by 35%. And then uh, feeling like they're not where they need to be in life was reduced by 30%. And then feeling that it's difficult to communicate was reduced by 29%. And feeling that what they do does not matter was reduced by another 29%. As far as effects on well-being, um, uh, it shows that increasing awareness of non-dual consciousness and the natural state had significant positive effects on all aspects of well-being, including physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. 71% of the participants said that um, they had positive effects on physical well-being. 100% said that they had positive effects on their mental and emotional well-being, while 71% said that they had positive effects on the spiritual well-being, and there were no negative effects um, reported on any aspects of well-being as a result of this uh, workshop. Also, um, there were interesting phenomenological findings on the behavioral component based on the reflections that I received um, every week. So it showed that in week one, with daily practice, uh, participants reported increased non-dual consciousness and the ability to apply this non-dual consciousness in real life situations, which reduced worry and um, it, it kind of allowed more focus on the process of things developing as opposed to outcomes, as well as increased compassion towards others and the ability to handle stressful situations and reduce this black and white thinking. And then after week two, um, with continued practice, participants were feeling more positive emotions such as hopefulness, acceptance, and calm, as well as optimism, connection, and gratefulness. And they started viewing stressful moments as temporary, um, and they were able to experience more positive and peaceful moments. And then after week three, participants were able to apply the knowledge of this emerging and relational nature of the mind by really becoming more, more aware of their own process of growth and being more compassionate and forgiving towards themselves as well as others. Um, so overall, participants really feeling, um, were feeling more um, uh, ability to tune into this natural state beyond the conceptual mind um, and to really access this non-dual consciousness over the four weeks. And as a result, they reported having a sense of higher purpose and being a part of something bigger. Um, and this also led to increased creativity and confidence and improved sense of meaning and agency. There are a couple of testimonials that I'm sharing here, uh, but I'm just going to read one of them. Um, this person was um, actually a graduate student and she was experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety for 14 years. She said, I noticed profound changes in physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of my life. My anxiety level was decreased and I'm able to let go of thoughts and stress, stressful situa situations easily. I feel connected to God spiritually. This gives me peace, stability, and hope. I feel emotionally and mentally stable. I'm able to present, be, to be present in the moment and can hold conversations with people. 
This was a goal for me, and I'm so happy I'm able to achieve it. I would always get distracted in the middle of conversations, but now I'm able to initiate and engage in one-on-one -on -one and group conversations. People have noticed the change in me. They tell me I look happier. I agree. I feel happier and more confident with my life. So what are the conclusions and some implications? Um, so really, the study shows that increasing awareness of non-dual consciousness and the natural state can really contribute to prevention and early intervention for anxiety and depression in young adults. It can also improve overall mental health and well-being and increase critical thinking, creativity, and collaborations, which is really the, the key skills that are required for the future of work. It can also contribute to the reduction of stigma around mental health and reduce the need for medication and therapy. I also want to mention that I re repeated this study during the pandemic in February, March 2020, with 13 graduate students from the University of Toronto, and I was able to replicate and get the same results in the reduction of symptoms of depression and anxiety. Currently, methodology is used for mental health literacy programs. I'm offering a course called Building Mental Resilience in Uncertain Times currently as part of the University of San Diego Professional and Continuing Education Program, and it's getting really good reviews. And then I'm also offering online webinars at corporation, corporations and educational institutions. Obviously, much more research needs to be done on the effects of non-dual consciousness on young adults as well as the general population and how this experiential knowledge can be introduced at different age levels. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for your interest um, in, in this research. And I would like to also thank all the other researchers. Uh, uh, and I'm really happy to be a part of this conference and I'm proud of everybody's work. Um, thank you so much, and I'll just leave you with a couple of references at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Hello, my name is Jack O'Keefe. I'm a spiritual teacher and a writer and a founding member of the Association for Spiritual Integrity. Today, I'd like to talk to you about phenomenal consciousness. For thousands of years, in scripture and in practices, spiritual teachers and spiritual seekers have been working to arrive at phenomenal consciousness within their psyche to shift through non-local lenses of perception and to experience directly, immediately, phenomenal consciousness. In doing so, we arrive at a knowing, a realization that phenomenal consciousness is fundamental. The experience of phenomenal consciousness is non-local. And this is central to what this talk is about. I want to explain why it is non-local and the implications of that. Spiritual experience and consciousness. Phenomenal consciousness, I'm going to call primary consciousness. I think it's a better term for what I want to explain. Primary consciousness. We say it's a spiritual experience. However, the spiritual experience can only happen when the personal eye, the subjective local lens of perception is not running. And so from that point of view, we say it's impersonal because the me, myself, I is not in view. It actually doesn't exist. That lens of perception is not active. And in effect, there is no I. Your memory will tell you afterwards that I experienced primary, fundamental consciousness. But you know that it's memory only that adds in the ownership of the personal I to it. Primary consciousness. We say it's impersonal. We say there's a direct experience. Phenomenal consciousness. 
what happens when we experience it is that there's a realization that that is more of what we are than the me, myself, I, Jack O'Keefe, woman, time, space. We see that those points of view, those layered understandings of, of space, of time, of stories, personal identity, self-referencing network, these layers of other perceptions are are on top of a fundamental understanding of primary consciousness. And that primary consciousness shows up to be more authentically what we are than any story that's time-based, that's conditioned by our thinking. Secondary consciousness is my capacity to be conscious. So that's my personal consciousness. It's an indirect experience and it happens to me. The split between the two is essential because secondary consciousness gives me an experience. Primary consciousness, if the me wants to experience primary consciousness, it can't show up. It's there fundamentally all the time, outside of time. And what blocks it is running the me perceiving mechanism. In the absence of the personal lens of perception, the secondary consciousness, primary consciousness is there. Primary consciousness is the work of spirituality. Secondary consciousness is the work of religion. That difference is important. So spirituality is experience-based. It's got to do with an unfolding, with realizing It's not learning. It's not new conditioning. It's more eureka moment, eureka moment in terms of like you're walking on the beach and you get this idea that you were never, ever thinking about some problem and lo and behold, you see the solution. It's more that happening upon something that that is open, that is mm, freeing. It's like the clouds part. It's a direct experience. And it's like, oh, that's the truth underneath it. That's the way forward. That's, that's what is. And so the spiritual experience is very different. It's a realization. Religion, on the other hand, it claims certain things to be true. And beliefs in these claims are what are encouraged. Entirely different things. I don't know how they ever got mixed up but they did. Existence is not fundamental. This is very important. And I think a reason why existence is clouding out the recognition of primary consciousness, phenomenal consciousness. Existence, as we peel back layers of perception, the me, myself, I go deeper into the stillness where there is no me running, where you can see that your brain does the me, myself, I. And we drop deeper, you can say, into observer, into the mindfulness state. And then we go into being, the human doing, the human being. We're in the being layer. And there's what is. And you can stand there in this is the ground of my being. In that layer, existence shows itself to be also a concept that your identity as a human being is resting upon. We want to imagine that we are real and here and now, and we are, but we have to turn on the localized perceiving mechanism in order for that to be true. When you go deeper than the localized perceiving mechanism and your spiritual journey takes you there, you discover that the idea that you are is also based on a concept believed believed into mm, the structure, the matrix of what creates this life that we call. And so it's important that existence is not valid at all in terms of being a baseline or fundamental for something. We're missing the point. Consciousness is much deeper than that. Primary consciousness reveals existence itself as a pure concept without anything needing to have the attribute of existing. Now we've gone from I exist to existence itself as a pure concept, which can be seen from the fundamental, pure, phenomenal, primary consciousness. Secondary consciousness, I exist. So there's the personal ownership. 
to find the fundamental baseline consciousness that spirituality points towards for millennia, the fact that I want to get it is going to eclipse the perceiving of what is deeper than I. Primary consciousness is never personal. It's in the absence of the personal that it has a, a, enough space to show up, that our attention is available. So how does the direct experience, the immediate experience, not the experiencer, but the immediate experience of primary consciousness become data? And this is where I feel the overlap is with science. Here's my question. Can science broaden its paradigm to include primary consciousness, which is known only through direct experience, through not indirectly through the me, but directly consciousness showing itself to itself? How does this direct experience become data? I don't have the answer, but what I do know is that the instruments that measure the external objectified world are not the right tools because they're based in subject object perception. The tools are incorrect. If the tools can be abandoned and this talk in some way opens something for a viewer, that would be wonderful. If it's possible, to think outside the box, can the paradigm be broadened? I don't know what that looks like. Spirituality offers pointers to primary consciousness, like I'm doing right now, techniques and teachings that break down the presupposition of collective beliefs, such as me, myself, I, time, space, existence itself. And we do see that these are concepts that are being believed into, my, into uh, my perception of the world and I'm creating the world with these collectively agreed beliefs. That doesn't make them true. It doesn't make them true at all. It makes them valid in order to make uh, the world seem real so that I can function. That's all. And science, on the other hand, offers data that proves or disproves what it could be useful for is to prove or disprove what's symbolic, myth, superstition, hyperbolic, from the perspective of spiritual seekers. I think there's, there's certain things that science can um, blow out for us that we haven't seen so far. I would also like science to, to how do we turn this into language that's not so nebulous and how can it be turned into data i know there's a way we're just not there yet and the spiritual sector is not equipped with that way of approaching things here's the journey if i can point it out it's looking like it's upwards however for some people it's going backwards which i think has to do with with using different parts of the brain in order to to translate what is fundamental consciousness, primary consciousness? How does that show up or reflect in our brain? Because our brain is not the source of it. Our brain is the source of the me, myself, I, and space and time. However, at another point, it's not in the body. The origin is not in the body. But the effect of it is in the body. So for some people, it's the stepping back is where they find it. And for other people, it's about going downward. It's directional, which is kind of bizarre. I don't know why, but it is. For the sake of this chart, it's above. <laughs> so looking at the bottom of it, me, mine, me, myself, I, me and my world. Then we can observe. Yeah, I'm sitting here. I can observe. I have an observing capacity that sees me talking right now. When we go deeper than that, we come into the beingness. My, I exist. I am. Deeper than that is the timeline. Timeline shows up as an arc. And then it's possible to stop it and it goes forward and it goes backwards. Once you've gone deep enough into the, the, the primary fundamental layer of pure consciousness, the timeline comes in and out. Every moment is now. You can see that this was all a replay. You can see the timeline from different zones. 
got nothing at all to do with space. Space breaks up at a deeper time. So time and space, are, are, that, that needs to be decoupled. Deeper than the timeline, okay, we come into timelessness. There is a sense of presence here, of knowingness where there's nothing to know. It's knowingness itself. There is no knower and knowledge, that triad, a knower, knowing, knowledge. The subject object of the knower and knowledge collapses. And at this layer of perception, there's just knowingness showing up. Deeper than that, it feels like spaciousness. We're into pure awareness, pure spaciousness. In spiritual world, words, it's called pure awareness. Really, it's a felt sense of spaciousness, which, which kind of um, arises. You don't look for it, you don't create it, but there's like, whoa. The experience of vastness is how the body registers this viewing point. Here, the concept of space is valid because space is the first concept. concept. It's, it's, it's the rollout, the first phenomenal, contextual concept on which other ones are built. Now, deeper than that, we have primary consciousness and it's not a concept. And that's the bummer. Now, it's a concept as I'm talking about it, but in its essence, it's not a concept. And that's the shift that has to be seen to be true. In spiritual, spirituality, the term awakening, self-realization, has to do with this layer where the identity with primary consciousness happens. And it's, that's what I am. That's my true nature. That's my essence. And most spiritual paths stop here with identification. That's my true nature. That's what I really am. And in form, the other lens of perception create me and the personal, but it's illusory. And illusory is the Buddhist term for it, or it's transient, other traditions would say. What happens deeper than that? Very few go deeper than that. I mean, really very few go deeper than that. The identification with true nature, with baseline. You could call that God too. Absolute Brahman, depends what tradition. The identity with that goes, but that's very rare. We're left with consciousness that cannot know itself. There, it, it doesn't... It, it's such a fundamental that it actually can't know itself. However, it is known. You can drop back there and it is known, but you can't bring yourself there or your capacities to know it. It's almost like it's so fundamental that it can't turn around and see itself. It doesn't see itself. That's too much movement. That's movement such as space, time and identification and me, myself, I and, and the building of my movie that happens. To look at it another way, if we look at it going backwards, so the stuff of life and, you know, I'm no scientist, but maybe that's particles because the observing, perceiving capacity has to be active. Like when you're in deep sleep, this perception observer is not active and there ain't no life. So the observing capacity creates my life. Looking back from that, the field of potentiality. Go back. Disconnect from the lenses, the overlays that we all learned how to build as a child to discover, oh, there's you, me. You have a name. I have a name. Oh, and all these caked in very often layers of perception were put into place as if what they produce is reality. It's not at all. It's a subjective viewpoint that has nothing at all to do with the truth of your being or deeper than that, the fundamental, the fundamental primary consciousness. Behind the timeline, the I am, where we identify with I exist, the amness, the verb being, this is the being. Then we've got the pure I, that it's all I, unified field. There is only one field. Unified field kicks in here. We call it non-dual. The experience is spaciousness, spaciousness, vastness, because it's broad and it's wide open. Because there's no limits. Because everything is interconnected. Seen and unseen, form and formless. Deeper than that, that singularity, that unified field is one too many. It's one too many. 
that leads us into primary consciousness. Here's my definition. Consciousness is the self-contained capacity that manifests form and formlessness and reflects its own creation unto itself. It has the capacity to imagine its own existence. It includes individual consciousness, which comprises the dreaming and waking states. Looking back on this last slide, the fundamental primary phenomenal consciousness. It has a capacity, it doesn't even know itself here. However, it has a capacity to show up with a sense of emptiness, to show up as one, to show up as a one who can reflect on itself and recognize that it is, and we have the concept of existence. And it can go from that sense of vast spaciousness and that unified field into time, which appears as a dot, and it opens up into an arc. And from there, we have phenomena. And we have the brain comes in with the capacity to create difference and to label and to see patterns and to create patterns. All the while, it is primary, fundamental consciousness birthing, reflecting itself to itself. There is no external creator. It comes from and returns to. Nothing is lost or gained ever. And that's the freedom of spirituality. That pure, primary, fundamental consciousness is creating and destroying itself continually. Why? Well, there's no why that exists back there. The why can only exist down here in time and space where we ask questions like that. And so consciousness is self-contained. It's a capacity that manifests form and formless and reflects its own creation unto itself. You see, it never doesn't lose or gain in anything it creates, no matter how dark or how evil and how clear and light and open. It doesn't lose or gain. It's only its own substance at all times, showing up in different forms. And so it has the capacity to imagine its own existence and to believe its own creations to be real. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of awakening, spiritually awakening. That's my timer. And so phenomenal consciousness, it's all about how we approach it. This is an invitation to collaborate between science's expertise in discovering data and hard facts with the spiritual pursuit of unearthing that which is prior to form and phenomenal measuring standards. Together, we can expand the understanding of consciousness in a way that neither science nor spirituality has been able to convey on its own. Thank you for your time. This presentation is called States of Consciousness, Phenomenological Data and Biophysical Concurrency. My name is Ian Kinnair. Just a brief background, I earned a BA with Math and Economics from Claremont Men's College. Went on with a Lehman's Fellowship to study Anthropology at the New School for Social Research in New York. And then earned a Juris Doctorate from University of Oregon with a Statement of Completion in Environmental and Natural Resources Law. And I'm looking to examine the confluence of social sciences and physical sciences, in particular pertaining to states of consciousness research. From the social sciences perspective, I'll predominantly focus on the theory that's consistent with the Boasian approach, named after Franz Boas, who looked to cultural contexts and ethnographies as a way of understanding cultural practices. This was in variance from earlier researchers such as Tyler and Morgan, who espoused an evolutionary approach which called a hierarchy from supposedly simpler cultures to more complex cultures. Boaz, however, gave primacy to the realities that, of those that he studied, as well as their accounts of them. In the physical sciences, uh, look to physics, neuroscience, 
quantum mechanics and what's become known as the many worlds interpretation and look to the correlates of states of consciousness with some of these physical techniques of recording data. Given these broad interdisciplinary traditions, I will look uh, first to the social sciences, which is my primary background. And within the social sciences, in particular, um, states of consciousness, including shamanism, lucid dreams, where the observation is important, participant observation being an important method of data collection. Now, as a disclaimer, the views presented herein are those of myself, the author, and not of any represented uh, or any organization. And to start with, I um, came across this work by Shoko Yonoyama called Animism in Contemporary Japan, Voices for the Anth Anthropocene from post Fukushima, Japan. This work looked at four individuals and the relationship between those individuals and the environment um, through lengthy interviews and life stories, including activists, those who went through um, recovery from toxic methyl mercury poisoning and uh, spills into the environment. In particular, one of the life stories I found interesting and compelling is that of the filmmaker, and I'll use the format in the book, the family name first, Miyazaki Hayao. Miyazaki's films are pretty well known, including Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, Howl's Moving Castle, and others. Um, in association with Studio Ghibli. He recounts his struggles in coming to terms going through wartime Japan and trying to understand some of the militaristic history and found that he was at a loss for being able to come to terms with these until he came to a more profound uh, in a relationship of the environment with the individual and the connections that that um, held. And that's reflected in many of his films as are forays into spiritual realms, uh, including the film Spirited Away. Also invoking place names is a Native Names Project hosted by Coeur d'Alene Tribe. You, there's a link on the slide to the webpage, which, and it involves a geographic information systems software. At the time I had a chance to work with it, uh, it was on ArcGIS, ESRI. Now I believe they use ArcGIS online. They hosted data pertaining to native names for places. And they were able to include hyperlinks, which allowed one to click on certain locations on a map and call up audio video recordings. And this included elders speaking about the importance of particular places and place names. This was done through a protocol that was to be respectful of tribes as well as the appropriate level of sharing. Um, so it had to go through an approval process in order to um, assure that the information on these, uh, this database, which is hosted by the tribe, is appropriate for those purposes. And this was uh, very illustrative of the connection 
between places in, say, a waking state of consciousness, as well as perhaps a more significant meaning in other states of consciousness as well. And this coincides too with uh, the Boazian approach to looking at cultural context, as well as participant observation as a data collection methodology. With this participant observation, uh, that's also been a critical approach to the study of shamanism and lucid dreaming. And uh, at my bio at the end, I'll also include a link, um, or which I've attached, include a link to a paper that I have written on the topic specifically looking at those two states of consciousness. Now with shamanism, the practitioner often invokes uh, what may be called a shamanic state of consciousness through techniques such as drumming or ingesting uh, plants or other ethnobotanical substances that lend uh, an induction into a different state of consciousness within which the practitioner may perform healing or other tasks important to the culture or individuals involved. And there may be neurological correlates of brain activity that, that show that uh, these are occurring in different states of consciousness. Lucid dreaming also has a volitional element where the dreamer may recall some pre-planned tasks for a dream and within the dream uh, recognizes the dream state and carries out those particular tasks which may be towards healing or retrieving information or other tasks that may have been planned in the waking state of consciousness beforehand there are uh, biological correlates that correspond to lucid dreaming, such as gamma wave activity. And that is typical of cognitive abilities, um, but it also in, involves uh, rapid eye movement, which is typical of dream states. So the precepts that are applicable to looking at these particular states of consciousness include um, the primacy of the role of the observer which is one of the facets of interpreting quantum mechanics as the method of observation seems to impact the type of data that is collected and with the Q Everett model, those, in, those uh, types of transformations come through as a universal wave function as opposed to decoherence into single states of being. Uh, it's actually reality that branches out. And that derives uh, from the well-known double slit experiment where photons were emitted through two slits onto a screen showing an interference pattern. However, when one slit was blocked, it no longer showed the interference, but rather a pattern of individual photons. There are variations on this theme, including Wallace in the emergent multiverse which looked at more of a coarse-grained approach and included decoherence in a many-worlds type environment. Penrose looked at other quantum mechanical interpretations as well. And Roselli and Stella also examined the role of the observer, or in this case, a dead-alive physicist, Schrodinger's cat, and looked at the role of observer and consciousness.
uh, states of consciousness could be construed as windows to other realities so that recorded accounts are actually accounts of a reality and as opposed to maybe an individual interpretation. And again, this stems with the precept I'm using uh, through the Boazian tradition. Other implications may be the directionality of time may be fluid in states of consciousness. There's often a feeling of transcendence. Within quantum mechanics, there's a subfield known as quantum wrench retrocausation, which looks at the possibility of causation as being fluid and nonlinear. When that happens, that may give rise to large uh, effects from possibly the future. And uh, within the realm of chaos theory, uh, that includes a sensitivity to initial conditions and if retrocausation indeed exerts effects on the present, then those in turn may have larger effects as, uh, in either a sing singular fashion or in a branching fashion as well. Uh, states of consciousness are correlated with different types of activity Cognitive functions have been shown to be correlated with gamma wave oscillations. And dream states, as mentioned earlier, are associated with rapid eye movements. Meditative states may be associated with certain EEG type uh, readings and activity. In a neurobiological model of dreaming, in a uh, paper in the book, Lucid Dreaming, New Perspectives on Consciousness and Sleep, uh, treats lucid dreaming as, as a hybrid state of consciousness with levels of cognition and volition uh, that correspond to uh, potential uh, gamma wave activity. They Propose that near death experience might be outside their model of some form of singularity and questioned whether states of consciousness are a continuum or discrete. Whoever believed that there really was not a definable point or reason in the formalism to invoke a separate mathematical process for what had been called decoherence, instead finding that reality is, as you call, or other authors would call many worlds interpretation, would branch out and into different realities. But the observer in those cases could not convey information from one branch to another. Gamma waves and neurodegeneration were studied in a mammalian uh, mouse study where light was shined through optogenetics to induce uh, gamma wave activity. And the researchers found that reduction in the plaques, the amyloid plaques that typically uh, result in Alzheimer's. And uh, the study shows that the gamma wave uh, is the same type that is often correlated with co cognition. And this has possible implications for neurodegenerative prevention. There have been studies, uh, mammalian mouse studies or uh, rat brain studies that show a surge of gamma wave activity in the dying brain of the rats concurrent with cardiac arrest. Other researchers have also observed this type of what they call end of life electrical surges or ELES in humans that 
have gone or were undergoing cardiac arrest. And the researchers suggest this supports further study of this type of gamma wave electrical activity and surges. There are possible implications for further study, for example, pertaining to out-of-body or near-death experiences and their correlation to such potential electrical surges in gamma wave activity. So there's an opportunity for longitudinal studies of cognitive function using this gamma wave stimulus. Um, there may be further studies associating brain activity with dream states, as well as an analysis of dream states for con content, such as through the sleep and dream database. And there's a link on the slide, and Kelly Bulkley is the director. So there may be implications as well for quantum retrocausation, and perhaps gamma wave activity can be used to show uh, implications of potential nonlinearity, as well as uh, the cognitive benefits and interconnections and entanglement in time as well as space. I believe that states of consciousness research may uh, shed some light on these potential connections. I want to thank all of you for participating in this conference and thank the University of Arizona, Center for Consciousness Studies, and the Science of Consciousness Conference, and the authors who have contributed to our understanding in these areas. And for more information or questions, my contact information is on the slide. My name is Ian Kinnair. And I can be reached by email, kian at humble.edu. Thank you for your time.